Good evening. So thankful for you. Appreciate you so much. And what a great opportunity it is to be together and also to spend a few minutes studying from the Word of God together. We'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians will be in the 10th chapter. A little bit of a follow-up from last week's uh, Sunday night lesson about being battle ready. We'll do this text uh, because it uh, came up a couple weeks ago in our Sunday morning class. Mike brought up a phrase from this text and several things from this text connected in my mind to last week's lesson. And so I just kind of pushed it to this week so we can look at the text as a whole. And so we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, battle ready, thinking about those strongholds. You know, if we're going to possess a weapon of some sort, whether it's maybe in a military setting or a law enforcement setting, or if we have access to a weapon for self-defense purposes even, a weapon, a weapon of any variety is of little use if we have not first tested it. There's legend of a set of English troops who were sent into battle against the French, been recently equipped with brand new swords. They go into battle and they're completely decimated. To the man, every person perished from that company because those swords were made cheaply and they all buckled and broke in battle. They were not tested first, therefore they suffered for that unfailing to test them. Remember David's response to King Saul, right? David's decided he's going to defend God's honor against Goliath. He goes to the tent. King Saul says, here's my armor. 1 Samuel chapter 17 David says, verse 39, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. I've not tested these out in battle. I'm ill-prepared if I go in with the wrong preparation. I'm ill-prepared if I go in with weapons and armor that I have not tested. And so he takes with him his sling and those five smooth stones and that shepherd's pouch a weapon he had tested, a weapon he was familiar with, a weapon which he knew what it could do. God won the battle, yes, but David entered it knowing what had been tested, what would prove to be successful, not entering a battle untested. When we turn our attention to 2 Corinthians 10, we're reminded that being battle-ready means to be properly prepared, properly prepared for the correct battles, Properly prepared not only in knowledge of truth, but also in preparation for how we present that truth. When we think about how weighty and how overwhelming at times the world can be and all of its arguments and all of its mistruths, and they're so contradictory even to themselves, and yet we see how quickly and how easily so many, the vast majority of the world, buy into those lies we can quickly begin to think, well, there's just no way we can ever reach people. There's no way we can change people's minds. There's just no way we can compete with this or that. And yet one of the principles Paul leans on here is that we have in the message of truth, we have the power that comes from God to destroy strongholds. Arguments and lies that may have become firmly set by way of repetition, truth still can destroy and turn over those strongholds. What Paul's going to do here is he's addressing these false teachers who've come in and they've tried to poison the minds of the Corinthians, hurting Paul's efforts. And he's going to, he's in the course of the letter defending himself in multiple ways, multiple times. But this text, he leans on principles about truth that help us to, to see that truth always prevails. Even when truth doesn't win over the masses, even when we suffer for truth, truth always wins. Truth always prevails against falsehoods. Listen to how he leans on those principles, beginning 2 Corinthians 10, beginning verse 1. I myself, Paul, entreat you, beg you, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away, beg of you, that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Pause. There you see he's addressing the, the context of these false teachers and these opponents of Paul. 
He says, I want you to straighten up. I want you to keep on growing. You've done some maturing and growing, and you need to keep on doing that. If you don't, I'm going to have to come and in person be strong with you. Be bold, corrective. It's not going to be pleasant. He's already knowing, at the end of verse 2, there are some that I will have to be strong with because they look at me, they look at my companions, and they say, they're walking by the flesh. Any number of reasons why they may have accused that. Perhaps Paul's treatment of the Corinthians about their issues with sin and division. Maybe they say, well, Paul's too harsh. He's walking by the flesh. Maybe they're jealous of Paul in some variety. Maybe they look at Paul's suffering. Good chance this is a factor when you look at chapters 11 and 12. They look at Paul's suffering and they say, a guy who suffers that much, there's no way he can be a messenger of God. If he was really an apostle, if he was really teaching truth, do you think God would let him suffer that much? And so they've turned it on Paul, accusing him of being one who's being manipulative and being one who's living by the flesh. Okay? So now he begins to dive into principles that help show that they are wrong and that Paul is, of course, of God. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, meaning live in flesh and blood, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Coming back around to their situation there in verse 6. Verse 7, look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of, your authority, of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. What Paul does here, is in order to defend his prior actions, in order to defend his own suffering in the Lord. He's showing them, here's why I do this. Here's why I'm able to do this. Because I'm preaching truth and the message of truth, and it will stand no matter the message taught by these teachers. So notice two just kind of points by way of introduction, beginning verses 3 and through 5. Notice that it's through his understanding of these spiritual principles about the knowledge of God and about its power, the weapons of our warfare. It's his reliance on those principles that he is able to then address his specific situation. And just think about that power for just a minute. That the more we are familiar with the principles of truth as found in Scripture, then the more we are able to uh, to respond in godly ways and healthy ways to any situation. It's a much healthier approach than running and trying to find a specific answer to everything that pops up and waiting until it pops up. That's fine and good sometimes. We, we get to where we have to, to just dive in deep to a specific thing because it happens. But you just think about general health, physical health, to carry on a, a daily approach to physical health, caring for our whole bodies in healthy ways, helps us when a potential disease or ailment begins to creep in instead of allowing something to get completely out of control, out of balance, and then having to address it. So Paul is using what he knows to be true from God, spiritual principles, to address his specific situation. Therefore, we must be um, familiar with those principles. But notice second, by way of introduction, this is uh, technically a different Initial context, des describing these taking thoughts captive and waging spiritual war, that's, this is not really the same context as found in Romans 6 and 7 on the spiritual battles uh, for our hearts and for our actions and for our minds. There are some connecting thoughts, and we'll go to Romans 8 here shortly to, to connect some dots. And so we can see those principles applied there. But this is thinking about Lies that are hurled at the church. Lies that are hurled at our own lives, at our own minds. Lies that are hurled at our children. Are we able to wrestle with and know truth so deeply that we can respond to all of those lies knowing truth undermines and destroys those strongholds? 
We're reminded as we dive into the remainder of our thoughts that the battle has been won, but the battle is still not done. There's still battles that must continue, waging warfare against the lies hurled by Satan, hurled by those who obey falsehoods. And so we must be prepared and prepared properly to defeat them. As we go through our text tonight, let's consider some prepositional phrases as our main kind of latching on two points here. First of all, notice the phrase, according to. According to. That's at the end of, of two, three, and then into four. They're accusing him of walking according to the flesh. He says, though we walk, we live according to the flesh. We don't wage war according to the flesh. But instead, our weapons have divine power. We are fighting, living according to the spiritual things, the things of God. <clears throat> and so notice that even though Paul recognizes they are operating by the flesh, living, teaching according to the flesh, he doesn't drop to their level. He recognizes it. He, he shows that that's the case. But he still continues to operate by spiritual thinking instead. He's not controlled by their inappropriate accusations, but instead is responding with walking according to the Spirit or living according, fighting according to the power of God. And so the main point here is that we wage war with weapons of divine power, not fleshly power. And that means that we have to decide that anytime we face a difficult situation, we have to address and, and work through a, a teaching or a potential false teaching, something like that, that we have to decide to handle it according to God. Handling it according to God's word, handling it according to God's power, instead of resorting to fleshly means to handle it. The more it involves other people, the more we have to be in tune with doing things according to God. Because we can, can soon and quickly be drawn to doing things in ways that will be hurtful, manipulative, maybe selfish. We must be sure we're constantly not fighting according to the flesh, but according to the things of God. Listen to what Paul would tell the young preacher, Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, because no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. You hear that? The soldier is not distracted by the things of civilians. The soldier is guided instead by the interests of his leader. And so when we're talking about these arguments, talking about these lies hurled in the direction of truth, we're not distracted by fleshly means, but instead we are propelled by godly means. The armor of God, chapter 6 of Ephesians, that we referenced last week that we'll be studying through in our VBS and summer series. That phrase, armor of God. It's clearly spiritual armor. They each relate to spiritual things. They have spiritual purposes. And so we're fighting, we're defending spiritually, not fleshly. Not drawn by emotions. Not drawn by uh, selfish attempts to do this or that. But instead, to do the things of God. Now to Romans chapter 8. Notice the difference here in the way of thinking. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. That's a point that Paul's going to make throughout 2 Corinthians. These opponents... They are hurling these accusations against Paul and his companions. They're setting their minds on the flesh. They're hostile not only to Paul, but to God himself. Here's why it's hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. So indeed, it cannot. It doesn't respect God enough to submit. Its minds are set on the things of the flesh. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we wage war. We live by it. The things of God, according to God and his divine power, not the flesh. Listen to how Paul closes 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He didn't have the chapters, but how our chapter 10 closes. 17 and 18. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Where's Paul's apostleship coming from? Where's Paul's 
uh, authority coming from? Where's Paul's qualifications coming from? Paul's not saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, trust me, trust me, trust me. He's saying God vouches for me. I'm in Christ. I've suffered for Christ. I share in the sufferings of Christ. So the Lord commends me. He challenges them to do the same. If you're in Christ, then, then you know that I'm of Christ. So we must decide once and for all and decide every day to live by, wage war against untruths according to the standards of God, not the standards of the flesh. One author says this, when we continue to position ourselves to gain power over others rather than to empower them as agents of God's grace, our congregations and families will simply fail to bear witness to God in our world. So that's the difference in the false teachers and Paul. They were leveraging their influence and leveraging their, uh, quote, authority and teaching in order to control people. Whereas power, Paul, and we'll read this later, leverages his authority for the benefit of people to em empower, build them up. That's because he's choosing to do so with the power of God. And we need to be aware of this, that plenty of people attempt to defend the things of God, but yet operate according to the flesh, instead of choosing to operate according to God's power. We must be aware, and I think 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, would bear witness to this, that to say the right thing in the wrong way can be just as damaging as saying the wrong thing. To be prepared, to be prepared to give an answer, to be prepared to destroy strongholds means to know the answer, but it also means to have prepared in how to present and how to answer and how to respond. We must decide to do so according to the power of God. But second, notice the prepositional uh, word, the preposition against. See, so these, these strongholds, these thoughts, these opinions, they're all intellectual terms. First of all, notice that. It's of the mind. And they are set against the knowledge of God. That's verse 5. And so we notice they are contrary to God's will. They are against God and his truth. But notice that intellectual component, that common bond between those terms. Paul, although he's being attacked personally, does not turn to and directly attack the teacher's Personally, he's saying their arguments are faulty. Their teachings are faulty. The truth always undermines falsehoods. But we also are always respectful for the fact that people have souls. And so these things are against the knowledge of God because they are opinions, because they are thoughts, because they are uh, intellectual uh, uh, in, their, in their basis. Arguments, opinions, thoughts, not people. Psalm 10, verses 3 and 4, the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, quote, there is no God. All of his thoughts, his thinking comes back to, I cannot accept what God has to say for me. And so when we begin to think about these issues and, and know there is a need to stand up and be prepared and be ready for a defense, we're defending the truth because these arguments are against the truth and they are against God. We're not necessarily trying to go about seeking to be against people, but instead their thinking, their thoughts, their arguments are against our God. You know how to... Uh, to understand and to know what a counterfeit bill is compared to a real bill. Amanda does that uh, several days a week at the bank at her job, handles a lot of real bills. And just the past week or two, there's a business that turned in their deposit, and she double-checked somebody else, and she, hold up, this one's, this one's fake. This one's counterfeit. She hasn't taken the time to learn all the possible feels or all the possible looks of a counterfeit bill, but because she's touched the real thing so often in counting it, she knows this doesn't measure up. See, all these false teachings are against the knowledge of God. When we know the knowledge of God, we are then best prepared to address any false teaching. Instead of having to 
to, to be distracted in every direction by trying to understand and learn every single nuance and every single possibility of false doctrine, we are best prepared when we are anchored and completely, thoroughly familiar with the knowledge of God, thus able to see this does not measure up. So Paul is saying the truth that undermines all these false teachings, all these people who are against the things of God. So when we know the knowledge of God, we're best prepared to stand up for him and for his truth. And thinking about uh, take, how we take this personally versus uh, the intellectual component of this, just think about David in that, that narrative of David and Goliath that we opened with. Remember, all the Israelites are afraid, and they're running in fear. They're not willing to stand up and, and step out because they're looking at the enemy. But David's offense is not just that these enemies, the, this enemy is bullying them. It's not just that they are bigger than them. It's not just that they have this seemingly unbeatable giant. But David's, one of his repetitive phrases is how this giant has defied God. That the giant, that the Philistines were defying their God. And so when David would make that promise to Goliath that he's about to kill him, he says he's doing so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Good song choice, Mike. And he will give you into our hand. See, it was against God. And he was standing up for God. And he did so in a very bold way, in a dramatic way, a way that, that needed to happen. And it was the power of God that, that caused Goliath to fall dead that day. But David's interests were rooted in defending God. So all these lies that float around about us and influence us and influence our children and grandchildren, they break our hearts, they overwhelm us, they try our souls. We must be able to separate the intellect, the untruth from the person and be able to attack and, and tear down those intellectual arguments while also respecting the person as much as possible because these things are against the knowledge of God. But third, along those lines, but notice the prepositions two and four. Uh, notice verse five is kind of one of these familiar phrases. We take every thought captive, but notice the phrase isn't finished. We destroy arguments, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive. There's not a period there. There's another phrase. To obey Christ. See, he's saying these falsehoods, they're standing in the way of obedience. And while we're still buying into these false thinking, we cannot then obey Christ. He's saying if, if they are allowed to come in and, and just poison you there, then you're going to be falling into disobedience. And so we have the power through God to take these things captive, to destroy them, to make them clear, make it clear that they are not of God, so that people will obey Christ, so that you will obey Christ. And so if we can continually remind ourselves that one purpose of this being prepared and being prepared for a defense and being prepared with the sword is obedience. If we win an argument, but no one is more obedient because of that argument, what have we won? If an argument doesn't, if, quote, winning an argument does not lead to obedience, what have we won? But also notice another purpose. We read verse 8, but, but just call to your mind what he said in verse 8. He says, even if I boast a little too much of our authority, listen how he describes the authority the Lord gave him, which the Lord gave for building you up and not destroying you. Catch the word play? The truth of God destroys strongholds. He gave me the authority not to destroy you, but to build you up. And so this battle scene really just takes on a lot of meaning and a lot of, of rich understanding. Because he says, I'm not the one coming in and trying to tear you down. I'm the one coming in to build up, to reestablish you, to, to cause you to, to grow in your faith, in your maturity in Christ. And so when we think about an end game for being prepared for the battle, it must be obedience. It must be building one another up. And you'll notice, he's building them up, but he has had to have some difficult conversations with them, not only in this letter, but in 1 Corinthians. And there are other correspondence 
and his time there in, in person. And so sometimes we have to have those difficult, those deep, those trying conversations, but we still must have the goal in mind of obedience, carrying it out and building up for the purpose and the glory of God. Notice how Paul weaves these things together in Ephesians 6. Verse 14, uh, so that we may, this is you know, obviously talking about the importance of maturity, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Now listen to how he follows that up. By human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So that's according to the flesh from 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, notice, when each part is working properly, obedience, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up, building up in love. We speak the truth, but the truth alone, the truth in an unloving way, the truth in a hateful way, a truth in a dis dismissive way will not cause the body to grow. We speak love, but love without the boundaries of truth and doctrine will not be supplied with the, the blessing of God. It will lead us away from God completely. And so we are expected to have both of those, truth, but done so in a way that is loving and thus building up and leading to obedience. Back earlier in his conversations with the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8, he has, to, he has to dive in, have one of those difficult discussions. He's got these uh, people who've been brought out of paganism and they have to decide, are we going to eat this meat that's been offered to idols or not? Well, what's the deal, Paul? And before he dives into the specifics of that and how to reason through it, he says, verse 1, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that, quote, all of us possess knowledge. He says, but this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You hear that? He's not saying throw truth out the window, but he's saying if all we pursue is knowledge alone and think that somehow knowledge alone will solve all the problems, he said clearly not. Because here you are divided, and we've got some knowledge about these things. Love is what will build up. And we decide that because love honors truth and because truth carries out love, we can then be given to and propelled to obedience and building one another up. And don't miss this in context. Paul's critics were resorting to personal blows and judgmentalism against him instead of paying attention and noticing that his message was indeed from Christ. So you see how he's contrasting himself with them. I'm here to build you up, Corinthians, while they are coming along and trying to tear me down. Be prepared. Be prepared with knowledge, but be prepared to enact and teach knowledge in such a way that it is receivable in love. It doesn't matter how we're treated. It doesn't matter how others respond. God's purposes are met when we bring these arguments into defeat for the sake of obedience and for the sake of building one another up. We think practically about this. Just think about the various scenarios of life where these principles are so important. And think about what Paul said as he began in verse 1. He entreats them. He begs them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He says, I was, I'm humble with you when I'm in person. Those are, some, those are three great descriptors for when we have these conversations. Meekness, gentleness, humility. If we apply those to our conversations with our children... When we're riding in the car and they ask us important questions about the Bible, about God, about our faith, about why we do this, about why we don't do this, about why others do this or that. Meekness, gentleness, humility, and giving the truth and giving the answers, but also doing so in a way that we've prepared to do it palatably so they can understand it. When others ask legitimate questions because they are seeking truth, that's the need for preparation the knowledge, the answers, but also the meekness, the gentleness, the humility. But also when others, critics, unbelievers, attack the truth. There'll be times when that happens. People ask us a question, but they don't have any desire to know the answer. They want to try to put us on the spot. Will we respond with meekness, gentleness, humility, and giving the answers that come from God? And of course, we also find ourselves having our own questions. We respond with diving into the Word of God. 
declaring once and for all in our minds, I'm going to let God speak on this. I'm going to live and answer according to His divine power. I want to do so with a gentle attitude, a meek attitude, a humble attitude before the Word of God. We have the need to do those things. So tonight, as we close, we need to ask the question, am I right with God? Do you need to become a Christian because you are outside of Christ? If you need to come to Him, know that His truth shows us the importance, the necessity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can obey that very gospel this very night. Please don't put it off. We'd love to see you put Christ on a baptism. The, to there be saved. To there have your sins washed away. To there be raised to walk in a new life. Please don't put it off if you've been thinking about it. If you've wandered away from him, don't let the devil creep in and, and convince you that it's not worth doing. That, it's, that there will be a better time. That there will be another time. Please take advantage and make the most of this time to make your life right with him if you are outside of Christ. Know that we are here for you. Would you come as we sing together?